and uh, Dr. Dinesh and all the distinguished friends here. You know, um, anytime when I visit Bangalore, the greatest joy that I get is by visiting National College. Because uh, <clears throat> it, it has brought me a lot of good memories. It has brought me a lot of fame, whatever that you can think. It is all because of the the knowledge that I have learned at National College, and I'm ever grateful. That's why I'm studying Professor Ramram. I would be very delighted to do anything at any time, you know, to National College uh, with no restriction. So because this is perhaps the greatest joy that I would get to be a part of this, uh, you know, very prestigious college because this college is known all around the world. And there are many, many outstanding students, much even better than me from this college. So I would strongly urge if there is anything I can do for you, please do not hesitate to contact me. Okay, so that's about uh, thanking you, all of you, for coming here. And I know that there are some people still standing, but there are some chairs that people can sit here also. Yeah. But, so it is. A little bit uh, a different talk that I'm going to give today. A uh, uh, little bit unusual because I'm very fond of mathematics, very fond of innovations and discoveries. But what is that I'm going to talk to you is a, a good experience and a visit uh, that I had just a couple of months back at a company called Qualcomm. I don't know how many of you have heard of a very, very famous company called Qualcomm in San Diego. And I've been very fortunate, they invited me to come and give a talk. And they would also said they would fund my university and research, but only on one condition that I should go there and give a talk. And uh, so when I visited there, in fact, a very interesting thing that happened, a very good old friend of mine who was the co-founder of the company, by the name of Dr. Erwin Jacobs, who was the one who was a professor at MIT in early 80s. And one day he thought I should go back and do something because what is the kind of an impact that I can have on all my work I did mention. He's a very bright person, Erwin Jacobs, because he also got the National Medal of Science recently. He's almost like a Nobel Prize in computing. So that company has done so well. So when I was giving a talk, I talked to a lot of the scientists. So one of the interesting things that happens in most of the companies in the United States is when they sort of come up with a product, what is the impact? So that is what I'm going to talk about it for the next 30 or 40 minutes. So very interestingly, they work on some of the TV technology. And you know, all of these iPhone and smartphones, how they have been able to integrate. Like one of the things Steve Jobs did at Apple, a very beautiful idea. In fact, Steve Jobs did not know even how to write a program. But he was so bright, he was able to come up with an idea, a design plan of synthesizing music and a lot of you know, communication and all the other interesting things on internet. Because that's very important because you know till the time that he came up with this iPhone, people were struggling, you know, because a lot of these musicians who wrote a lot of good music, they lost a lot of revenue because they were not able to get it. So he was able to synthesize all of these things very well and you know what is the end product of that. So I'm gonna talk about how the TV technology will sort of change for the next decade. Very beautiful. I will sort of go through an old view on this. Now, you remember, as I said, um, Paul Kopp, a very distinguished scientist by name Khalid El Malé, he was able to sort of project what we call as, you know, how do we want to have a TV to be viewed, what kind of innovations and things like that we will bring for the next century. I mean, you know, we are really talking about maybe another two or three decades from now. So, 
if you sort of take a look at it on the screen here, you will see there is a tremendous amount of, you know, innovation in the visual experience. If you look at it, even in the United States, as early as 1950s, that's fairly a very simple TV. But now if you look at it, how the technology has changed, how we can even sort of look at the three-dimensional view, and then there are YouTubes, so there are, and then there are cameras and the smartphones where you can take a picture at any instant of time. So this is what we call as a multi-screen visual experience. And there's a lot of technology embedded in all of those things. Even if you look at, for example, your laptop. Now the laptop that what we have today has the power of almost a major big computer but what we envisioned about 25 years back. I could do large amount of computing, I can do a large amount of uh, you know, storage in a different place. So there is a whole lot of things I'll be able to do. And now you see that basically this technology and even sort of using the multi-screen approach for all the visual stuff will keep on sort of expanding in that direction. So, what is very interesting here is how do you sort of deliver on the visual experience? So there are different ways that we can talk about it. You can download lots of content. That's what we really need. You know, especially if you suppose there are the younger generation would like to listen to a certain type of music, how do we do that? So that's possible nowadays, right on real time that we'll be able to do that. Now, there are what are called as premium content. You know, like everybody does not want to watch everything, you know. See, now if you look at the newspaper, it is all based on uh, visual experience because, and I'm sure there are still people who read the traditional newspapers, but if you look at it all around the world, those newspapers are going out of business because they don't like to see everything on the internet because that will be able to see and read and sort of digest the contents so that's going to be at your hands. Okay? Now, so the television that we are talking about, we should be able to see even the mobile contents because the producers of many of these shows, they'll be able to see ahead of time what would be the impact on people, you know? Like for example, a car manufacturing company, they would like to see, for example, what kind of color is good for a particular area. So they'll be able to take all the sort of feedback from the audience and they are able to generate on that. So many of these things are sort of produced, what we call as a, a carrier or a user-generated content based on what the people want. I mean, that's the kind of a technology we are talking. Now, you know that social networking has become very common everywhere in the world because, you know, whatever that happens, perhaps in New York at this time, you can see that pretty much on TV or anywhere else instantaneously. Because there are many, many powerful media things like, for example, the Google, the Yahoo. I mean, they will be looking for this instantaneous kind of information that can be projected on. Because there are lots of junk information also. Now social networking is very important because, but there is a little bit of danger also in that because, you know, there are a lot of film stops that trigger information. So the social networking is good, but it can also sort of go in the wrong direction too because how do you authenticate the information comes on the social network? Okay, so that's the whole idea, you know. So there's a lot of information on that. So there are many, many companies which are playing a significant role. Then, as I said in the beginning, the on-demand entertainment is also very critical. Because nowadays things are changing so fast. You know, like the, the movie that which I saw 25 years back, nobody will be interested nowadays. For good or bad, we don't know, but the technology is moving and there are lots of interesting new ideas and things like that are coming. So, the interesting thing is, there is also what is called as a video sharing and video conference. You know, like, 
if I am giving a talk, and I think Professor Ramdav has already done that, this talk can be shared by a lot of people, not only here, but many universities across the United States, or in Cambridge University, or any university. So there are facilities to do that, and instantaneously the people can hear and react to my lectures, whatever it is. So video conferencing is very important because traveling sometimes from east to west coast in the United States is tough. So if somebody is giving a talk at MIT on a very important innovation, that perhaps somebody at Cantex uh, can communicate with him and align himself during the conversation. That's important. So the video sharing and video conferencing. And now, so there is a new idea that has come right now, what is called as online degree programs. It's very important. I mean, you know, in olden days, I never used to think very good of online programs. But now, every best universities like MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, all of them have online courses. And it was like a professor who can be sitting at home, can be giving a talk on a database, or he can be giving a talk on biological systems, or he can be talked on giving a gene therapy course. And it can all be on the system, and he can be delivering, and that can be shared, you know, by all people. So that kind of kind of courses is very important, and that's going to be the trend because if there is a very outstanding speaker who can communicate well, who can communicate his experience, both social as well as regular science courses can all be loaded on the online courses. So every university is sort of looking in that direction also. So this is another important aspect in years to come is going to go. Now broadcasting TV and the mobile TV that we already have seen here in India is growing very rapidly. Now, streaming video, that's very important. For example, when you are talking about information communication, you are talking about large amount of information. How do you stream like? So how do you store it? I mean, you know, so what kind of bandwidth, what kind of communication network that you have? So there are lots of technology problems. Qualcomm is working on that. So one of the interesting things is not only you have this visual data, what I call, but how do you deliver it is very important, very accurately to every part of the world. You know, it is so beautiful to see in India at least, I, because I saw during my trip this time, I was coming from London to China and then to Taiwan and then to Malaysia and then to Bangalore. I mean, you know, China is growing very rapidly with many of these delivering the visual experience too. There are many, many companies are started with that idea of how to deliver and how to streamline this large scale data. So when I talk about the data, it's not just the numerical data, I'm also talking about the image data. So what is the vision that you are sort of looking at? It? So things are progressing very rapidly in many of these directions. Now, so take a look at this diagram here. So the digital what I call as the video drives, which sort of what we call as an internet data traffic, you see that the yearly growth and the percentage of total internet tra data traffic, the video streaming is about 48%. So that's pretty much common. And in years to come, and it will rise even exponentially. So you can see that how, for example, if I have some file, how it can be shared somebody who is sitting in Delhi and how we can communicate. So, one of the interesting thing is how do you sort of look into the web data. So, take a look at how this has sort of expanded into the digital video drives on the internet data traffic and how we sort of going. This is the data transmission petabytes of information and uh, you know, you can see basically how like 2015 this can you know, so what in essence we are talking here is over well, half the internet traffic today is all by video. So that's a very important statistic that we need to know. That means 51% is all the video transmission. So there's a lot of you know, interesting research problems that can drive us into many of these markets. Okay? Now we predict in the next three years or four years, 90% of all the internet traffic 
will be video and uh, this is being the survey by one of the interesting person by name David Say from the Cisco as the vice president. So you can see the importance of the delivering information through the video is very critical. So our technology should also be tuned towards in that direction. Okay? So that's another thing which I'm sort of telling. So, so let's kind of summarize what are the key factors that is affecting the viewing experience. Okay? So the TV and the contents of the video also, that's very, very important. Now, when we look at it, it can be the professional content, or even like the online courses that we are talking, or maybe sharing a very important idea between the two companies. Then user-generated content, because when a particular user communicates on the internet, there's a lot of data that we communicate. Right or wrong, we are not interested in that, but the data that we collect and also we generate are uh, huge. Then the question is, do we have to pay? For example, we are paying or do you want to start to make it free? That's also an interesting question. Now, of course, the most important thing is the quality, the visual quality. So, so now I look at it, there are maybe about 200 channels that we have or even more than that. So the choices are many in many of these kind of things. Now, when you look at the viewer, now, the kind of viewers we have depends on, you know, how old is he, what kind of interest he has, and uh, what is the expectation. I mean, you know, the younger generations are very different, and what are the needs also that is important. Now, the other interesting thing is, you know, the interaction among students are also very different, because you suppose you want to know more about me, right now, you can go to Google and put my name, and then you will get maybe tons of information about me. I mean, that's a very beautiful thing because, I mean, you know, you can really know about everybody, you know, who is sort of known around the world, and you can collect information in Google. Because Google essentially puts this information for public display. So, what is the interaction? So that's a very important information because, you know, like, for example, if, if you know, I went to China, there's a very famous university called Tsinghua University. I don't know how many of you heard. The most famous university and the, the students are outstanding. So I went there and then I was thinking, you know, some of the students may not know my background. Would you believe it? They have brought everything, you know, like when I went to school, what school I went, you know, almost 35 years back. So everybody knew, so there is no need. So the, the person who was introducing me, he just put a click on the Google, it delivered. So that's a very beautiful way of knowing the background of individuals on that. So interaction with others is also very important because this is a technology age or the universe that we are in, like how we can sort of learn from others. You know, that's a very beautiful thing in America is Qualcomm is a billion dollar industry, you know, I mean, they get people from all around the world. So when I was there, they, they asked me to give two talks. One, a talk on technology. So give me your perspective of what happens in the technology of TV technology. And then on a research topic, what is the discovery that I have made? So what is that they want to do is to see how they can interact with an individual like me and get a good feedback in the technology enhancement. So commercialization of technology is very important. I mean, just because I'm writing a paper has no meaning because what is the impact of this paper? What does it do to an average person is what it counts. So the viewer is important in this. Then in terms of the screen and the display, <coughs> what is the size of the screen? And nowadays you see that every way, you know, every type of the size of the screen, the screen resolution, then the, whether it is two-dimensional or three-dimensional, and what kind of quality. So this is also the kind of key factors in viewing the experience. Now, what are the conditions under which we view all of these things? Like, you know, I may be sitting there, and I don't know, um, do you have a Wi-Fi uh, sort of uh, opportunity for students to interact? You can also do that. 
So a lot of students, they don't sit inside the office rooms, they sit outside and they'll be communicating with students. They want to know, like for example, if there is a talk by somebody, what can they learn, what is the profile of the talk and so on. So the interesting thing is outdoor, theater, static, mobile and time of the day. So these are all the, what we call the viewing conditions in terms of uh, effect. So how do you sort of innovate the viewing experience? That's important because, you know, there are, I, by looking at the crowd here, I would say there may be about 120 people here. So how do I sort of innovate the viewing experience from this crowd? You know, what are the three innovations that we have enhanced or that have enhanced your TV viewing experience. Okay? So, if you look at it, there are 10 predictions of the future of TV viewing experience. Okay? This is, this is why I call it as the impact of science and technology. So, the kind of channels that we have, the traditional channels will go away because that's something, you know, and the kind of, you know, the remote that we are trying to use to get into a channel 10 or 15 years from now, that will also be doing, you know, so what happens is, as soon as I come in front of a TV, the TV will already have a knowledge of my background, what I do I like, okay? So, all that it will give you me some types of choices to sort of, not even the button, I can sort of use my hands to sort of communicate with the TV. So the old type of remote and all those things will certainly go away. Then, on the screen also, I can do the multiple viewing. Suppose there is a game between Australia and uh, England, I can look at one corner of my TV, and then on the other hand, I can be listening to Manmohan Singh Prime Minister's lecture, or maybe something else going on. So there is a choice that I have, you know, in viewing that. Now, if you look at it lately, the ads are the one which is playing for all the TV, and they also sort of will see, you know, not every ad that I see on TV I like. So they also sort of get into what we call as the, the ads which I like will be the one that you will see. So that's the other one. Now, the other interesting thing is, we, when you want to watch, there will be an occasion that I can be interacting with the um, TV also. How do I do that? Because you suppose a particular conversation that I don't like, I should be able to interact on the TV and say, look, this kind of conversation I don't like. Or this kind of, this part of the projection on the TV I don't like. So, then, there are friends that I can have to watch these kind of movies. So let's say if there are similar interests I have. So the idea is we can watch together and maybe watch in a, you know, in a different way, but it is all being sort of done based on the background of the viewer. Okay? Now the other interesting thing is your TV also follows you. So what do I mean by TV follows you in the sense? The TV, the television, can also encapsulate a viewer what is his likes and dislikes. Okay, because there will be always some question, you know, answering session. You know, I say I don't like this part of the movie, or I like it. So these are all very instant changes. I like this advertisement. So this kind of a thing can also. Now let's do, I want to do some groceries. So I don't have time. So I come home and then I press on my, you know, on my TV. It's almost like a computer then I should be able to log on and get all the things, whatever I want from the Walmart, and then they say it's ready to go and pick it up. So, then there is this experience of going to church or a temple using the TV also the time. So, the essentially, whatever that we are interacting with TV, the TV is also sort of following us. So, the other interesting thing is, um, the creation of talents will go viral in all of these kind of cases. So, what we are really talking is, many of these technologies are about to be there, you know, because one of the things that Microsoft is presently doing is, 
I don't need to go, go there and sort of log on in front of the computer and as soon as I go there, it has a picture of me and knows all about the details of how to log on, what is my password and all the history and what, you know, email and using and so on and so forth. So I don't have to be typing my login and the password ID. It's already there in some system, but that's going to become fairly common. Now, so the future of entertainment and the computing and the devices we love uh, is a, a book, a very beautiful book. And I think, uh, you know, if you are interested, you should read it because some of the things what I am sort of projecting now in this talk is the one which he is talking because computing also becomes very user friendly. I mean, you don't need to really know a particular programming language to interact with a computer. And so these are all the kinds of things, you know, that people would see and also the kind of devices that you have that can also be very small in a normal type desired devices that you can think of. Now, there is a very interesting book, I think, um, it is called Tom Cruise, A Minority Report. You know, everybody learns on June 21st. I mean, this book also talks about, you know, the kind of computing, the kind of television view experiences that we will have in years to come, okay? Now, so let's see what are the future uh, TV here. Now, smart TV. I think I already gave a little bit of a hint on smart TV. As I said, you know, every channel I don't like it. There are only few channels who will like it. Okay? And it also depends on how old we are. You know, if there are youngsters, they'll have a different liking. So the idea is the smart TV will enable you to sort of look into the channels that you are interested in, okay? Because, you know, if I am interested in cricket, that's the only one that will be projected and the later on we get a lower priority, just to give you a view. Suppose if I am interested in listening to BBC, that's the one, or maybe going to... So, every type of things that you are thinking can all be embedded. So, in other words, what in essence I am talking is a small part of your brain is embedded MTV. So what do I mean by that? So you know that we all make decisions. How do I make decisions? Because I do have certain rules embedded and those rules are sort of, you know, incorporated by neural networks or neural neurons that is being connected in my brain. So the moment I come here and say, look, drink some water. I know how to drink water. So there are some rules. So this kind of smart TV will have a part of your personality embedded on that. You know, that important moment. That's a very important creation that people can think about it. Now, there's another thing called connected TV. You know, there are always people who like to sort of watch with others. So there are maybe 100 TVs are connected, which have similar interests, and there are similar interesting uh, features they would like to see. So those are all being sort of classified as the connected TV. Then there are interactive TV. Now the interactive TV is like, you know, like when I'm watching a movie, I also want to play around, you know, like what is my email, whom I have to send an email, what is my priority of the email. I mean, you know, if I get 500 emails a day, not all of them may be good. So there are some priorities. So the TV would automatically will sort my priorities and how I can have to respond. If there is a deadline that I have to submit a paper or if there is somebody who I have to talk immediately, so it can all take into practice those kind of conditions and then you will be able to do an interaction with the TV. And then of course the three-dimensional TV, because it's most of the TV, even though we call it as high-definition TV and all, still there is what we call it the depth perception is not there. You know, there are some types of uh, interesting uh, features that we have where we would like to have a depth embedded on the TV. Then there are social TV, you know, that's very important because if you are a preacher or if you are, uh, you know, uh, somebody important at the temple, then what in essence you need to do is to see, for example, how you can connect yourself. You know, okay, the people who, are, who like certain type of temples, certain type of churches, 
So that kind of social thing is also there. Now, not only that, but there are other, you know, social networking is important. Because nowadays, without a proper networking, there is absolutely nothing you will be able to do. Now, internet TV, of course, that's, you know, pretty much is there already, where essentially your television uh, is being replaced by all of these internet activities that you can do. And then there are other, you know, high definition TV, then there are TVs personal to your own interest. Because you know that everybody may not have a you know, generic interest, but if I am really interested in only a few things, then I am able to get that kind of viewing experience on my TV. Now, immersive TV is very important because that gives you a three-dimensional motion analysis. You know, there are some interesting features on a movie Unless you see that in a three dimension, you will not be able to sort of appreciate. For example, there are medical doctors. So here is an interesting story I want to tell you. See, traditionally, uh, you know, lung cancer, let's take for example lung cancer. Uh, I think there are maybe some doctors here. So the lung cancers, what they normally do is they take, you know, an image of the uh, your lung and they sort of capture the, you know, the tumor and then they will start giving the radiation dose and then they will try to kill all the cancer cells. Okay, that has been the tradition, but that's not correct. I can challenge any doctor right now because we have done some work. See, what happens is whenever they treat a patient based on the tumor size, so we say that the tumor size is not correct because you know one of the other parameters, the fourth dimension is the, the motion of the tumor. Because what happens is when we start to breathe, the lungs also gets expanded and contracted, and the tumor also sort of changes its geometrical features. So the way in which they do is they take and look at the geometrical features, then they will calculate how much amount of dosage that is needed for radiation and they will kill. But by doing that, it's not very accurate. So we found a new method to find out how the movement or the motion of the tumor is also being taken into account. We came up with a very beautiful mathematical model and then we simulated it on real data. And then we found out that the motion of the tumor should also be taken into account when you start you know, sort of giving the treatment to your patient. So that's a new technology because that's very critical. It, you know, because you know that when the motion of the tumor is there, the geometrical shape also changes. It is not just a, a static dimension, so there are some dimensional characteristics of the tumor changes. So when we are sort of feeding or giving the radiation dosage, Sometimes, or uh, most of the times, we sort of kills the normal biological cells. And that's why you see that there are many people who get sick because of this kind of uh, treatment. I don't say it is not correct, but it is not 100% correct. So one of the things that we are sort of pursuing the idea is to take into account. So there's a software that we are developing on predicting the motion of the tumor using the fourth dimension. So, in this particular case, you know, this mobile TV can sort of project many of those things very interestingly. And there are other interesting things, you know, like TV 2020, this is perhaps the most intelligent television experience because it is pretty much almost like a human being sitting in front of you, communicating with you. So that's the kind of a thing that is also there. And then there are other online TVs because, you know, while you are watching, I am able to send some information directly to reach the target point. So, these are all what we call as the future TV in many of these things. So, the things which are of most interesting aspect here is the smart TV, the connected TV, the social TV and the personal TV are the ones which are going to be the future major impact on many of the television experience. So here is an example of connected TV. Now, for example, you have Yahoo. 
is being connected by TV. Because that's very important. I mean, you know, what we are nowadays doing is, is to go to that particular web page and look at all the things what's happening on that. Now, the internet connectable is also very important. Then the high definition TV is also a connected TV. A Google TV. So, all of these companies are already playing or spending and they are coming up with lots of these kind of innovations in many of these TV technologies. And this is very critical that you will see that because wherever and whenever you know, I have friends, when I talk to them, they will say these are all the kind of technology where we will be able to sort of take everything you know, in all of these kind of TV. This is the future TV. Now, smart TV. So at the smart TV, it also depends on the kind of applications that we are talking, you know, like uh, Samsung has already has a model on many of these applications, although there are a lot of secrets are not being come out. So the smart TV is, is maybe for a special dedicated application. So if I am a doctor, uh, and you know, you know that most of the surgery is, you know, especially the microsurgery is all being done by robots. These are intelligent robots controlled by the smart TV because, you know, the doctor is essentially looking at it, operating on any of these robots visually, and he is able to sort of perform his surgery. So, these are very useful, especially for many of the biomedical applications, because there are a lot of precisions that we need in order to do many of these surgical things. So, these are the kind of TVs which sort of play a very significant role. Now, there is also what we call as the smart development ecosystem, which is very, very important. Now, these are all the companies which are what we call as the application developers. I mean, they sort of define an application and they sort of defining it. Now, the kind of platform, you know, if you look at it, every uh, company like Google, Yahoo, and um, you know YouTube, Flingo, and there are many, many of these companies. They play a very significant role because then they're able to sell you know lots of uh, their own applications on these platforms. Now, one of the interesting things is how do you sort of manage the context. You know, we are talking about what we call as the visual-based context. You know, we are talking about the images, the audio, digital, video. And then also the textual information. How do you sort of synthesize all of these things in the digital form? Okay? So the content management is also very, very important. And so if you look at it, the content manage the distribution platforms of somebody. So what to give you some more ideas on the smart TV? system on chip solutions. So all of these things have been embedded on very small circuits. I think you will appreciate if you have done some work on what we call as real estate routing algorithms. You know, these are very small chip. It can hold billions of information and all the circuits and algorithms are embedded on that. Then the small kind of TV will have small browsers. I mean you also need small browsers. And then the other interesting thing is user interface. Because every user may not be smart. Every user may not be computer scientist. You know, he may be somebody who may not know even... The, so, if I, for example, don't know the Chinese language or the German language, but my user interface will enable me to act very efficiently with many of these applications. Synchronization. That's also very important because if you are sort of using multiple platforms, then how do you sort of synchronize all of these channels? How do you sort of synchronize the bandwidth? And then there should not be any delay, okay, between from one channel to the other. If the delay happens, the whole, you know, picture gets distorted. And this is all we are talking in real time. Real time is very, very critical because, you know, if I'm not able to send information from here to any part of the world, in less than a fraction of a second, then it is absolutely no good. So, that's important. Then, discovery, and there are lots of interesting, you know, discoveries that nowadays that happens 
from one company to the other, all can be documented and at the same time can be broadcasted. So the broadcasting and interactive TV integration, and you know, that includes the YouTube and uh, basically all the other things that one can think about it. Now, so if you look at the Best Buy, there are what are called as smart TVs and devices. They are only using what are called as sharp smart TVs and devices by type 0. So now you don't get all the features that what I am sort of telling you overall, but there are some features that you'll be able to get with many of these things already that is available. You know, like smart audio. Because let's assume that you and I have a conversation on some topic and everything that what we talk may not have you know, an impact. An impact means may not have any substantial content to sort of understand and move forward in the technology. So these kind of smart content devices will sort of abstract the relevant features in a document and it will be printed. The other interesting thing Best Buy's will do, where I was a part of it, you know like in many of the major corporate companies, they, show, they sort of sell so many articles, okay? So when they do it, automatically there is a receipt that is being printed and a, a copy of the receipt is being sent to the server. So by the end of the day or by instantaneously at any time, Walmart will have all the transactions that has taken place on computer. The amount, that's why they are able to project you know, how much of business is needed, what is the business has happened. So what it happens is, as soon as they finish the transaction, this transaction being sort of put on a receipt is being printed and sent to the cloud computing to store somewhere. So that is the one they will use it for future television smart. So, for example, if there is a product, if they are not able to sell it for maybe 10 days, then that, that will be discarded, then they will go on into that. So, there's a, a variety of things that the Best Buy, Walmart and many of the major companies are doing. So these are all the kind of things, you know, smart TV and also they collect a lot of information about the customers. Like for example, in United States, especially in Ford, there is what is called as a football. It is not just like our soccer, it's a different type of football. So normally the football games, all the men watch football the women go for shopping. So the women, what they normally do, they say, okay, look, John, you take care of the, you know, let our son, I will go and do some shopping. So what they normally do is, in many of these Walmart, you know, when some of these things are going on, they know how to attract the customer. So when a person, if there is a ball game tomorrow, the previous day, the wife, will go and get a lot of beer and some potato chips and all of those things so that she can keep her husband sort of do a babysitting with uh, their children. So on those particular game days, the Walmart knows people are not interested in going all the way inside the big mall. So they know strategically where to keep those kind of, uh, you know, materials like the potato chips or the beer, whatever it is, so that the lady can go and then go home and give it to the husband for the watching the ball game. So strategically how do you place your object to be sold is also very important. They do a lot of study, you know, in terms of what is the practical place that we can do. So they need diapers also to be changed during watching the ball game and the husband is taking care of the baby. So they keep they know where to keep the diaper. Because people do not have time to go all the way inside and, you know, look for. So those are all what we call as data mining. They collect a lot of these data. They do what we call as the real-time data mining because data mining is a, a machine technique which only collects relevant data which is needed for the target specification. So there's a lot of research interest is also embedded on many of these things. Okay, so this is one interesting point. Now the social team, so football also plays a very important role. Yeah, this is the kind of a soccer perhaps in Europe. 
So, you know, people are always are interested in talking about cricket, football and things because that's a normal conversation you start. So, many of these kind of TVs are meant to do this kind of conversation with this ball game going on. So, the social TV is also very important because it is also sort of giving a projection on the culture. You know, whatever the culture, the Western culture is somewhat different from the Eastern culture, so they want to embed the cultural statistics of data on many of these TV. So personal TV also, like there are many interesting aspects of it nowadays you can see, for example, there are uh, what we call as uh, the BBC and the HBO and there are so many you know, the complex contents of titles you can have. There are multiple access modes you can also have. Then there are mass personalization. You know, Anne's personal TV. Then, so you can actually convert a TV into your own personal interest by programming on that. So that's essentially what we call as personal TV. If I'm not interested in certain aspects, I can remove it completely and then sort of tune whatever that I want. So this is also a very interesting thing. So what they do is, they have what is called as a semantic video search engine, which is being designed by many of these companies, which sort of gives you a kind of an access to the programs that you would like to watch, you know, very highly on your TV. Now, there are other interesting aspects like you see on many of the TVs, there are lots of ads. Now, these ads are only sort of, you know, the interest ads because they do not really make a whole lot of money. In some cases, yes, you know, they always try to put or show a, a very, you know, top-notch uh, Bollywood figure or maybe a cricketer like Mahendra Singh Dhoni or somebody. So, just to sort of get your interest, on to the personal TV. So these are also another interesting thing that's going on on this. Then there is what is called as computational TV, you know. Now, these are what we call as an informative TV. That means you essentially have a computer inside a television. So what we are talking is that a computer watches a movie, what does it see? So that's the key future to the television is stop thinking about television as a television. It's no longer that. So the television benefits most from thinking of it in terms of width. So if you sort of look at it, we are sort of manipulating the binary digits. So it is no longer. So you can do and use this TV also as a computer. Now, for example, here Martha wake up, our TV is watching this. That can also happen because these smart TVs, you know, will always be watching you because we'll always see what you are calling as a behavioral pattern, you know, what time do I go to bed, what time do I do some things at home. So these are the kind of TVs which can also look into what we call as the personal desires and interests in human beings. So innovating the TV experience, what is the next? So one of the things that we sort of see is the ultra definition TV. You know, Samsung is coming up with this TV on uh, um, 82 inches LCD, and um, you know it has a very beautiful resolution, and it is perhaps the best, which is already in progress in some countries. But that's the one which you will see very soon. Now, there is also what is called as visible light communication. That means um, Samsung and other people, so they take a lot of wireless data from every light bulb and see how it can be integrated and synthesized into what we call as the visible light communication. Then, of course, you know, very interestingly, they call the concept of quantum computing. You know, Richard Feynman, in 1981, he thought about the idea of quantum computing based on the quantum mechanics, so that quantum dots can sort of, you know, look at the display, which is very beautiful, so we are able to even 
not see the display on your TV of many different aspects. So based on the quantum dots of many of these things. Then there is another TV which what we call as a smell o vision TV, uh, which is presently Samsung and University of California, San Diego. They are working on this. Now the TV will have a feature of you know the getting a smell. Because you see, dogs are very good in smelling. So for example, everybody has certain sort of an odor, so it is able to understand the smell and you know what a person brings and what the person interest in the TV. So these are all some of the kinds of things, you know, one can sort of look at it and by 2020 you will have most of these kind of features what I've been talking on this TV. Then there is also another interesting TV, what is called as Samsung Buell View and Buell Sound Technology. You know, this is very beautiful because you start of able to see a combination of the sound and the view very precisely to the point. And uh, so this is also another, you know, technology viewing experience. Now, this kind of thing has a tremendous application for biomedical applications because there are very, very sophisticated TVs like this. Like, if suppose a surgeon is operating on your heart, he also wants to see, for example, the heartbeat and other reverberations on your body, and then how it can be sort of viewed to do the surgeon, you know, any surgery on that. So there's also what is called as a dual view view also TVs, because, you know, like for example, Every viewer has a way to wear a special glasses to see the proper image. Not to mention that to get the right, I mean, you know, some people may have some eye problems, but that's not the... See, you need to synchronize the vision and the sound, and how do you sort of integrate that. So, the Samsung company has developed a new kind of glasses that can work both for two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. So, so, the channel that you are watching, can also display at you. So there's a whole lot of interesting and communication between the dual view TV. So if you look at it, there's a whole lot of languages that you can see all around the world. Okay? Now just to say thank you, you can see for example, you know, gracias and Vicky. So every different type of language in different terms, how can you say that? So the bottom line is the TV viewing experience in the next 10 years or 15 years is going to be very revolutionary and it will also very smart because it's almost like a smart person, like a human being who can interact with the TV. So it is not just what we used to call as an idiot box, sitting there and watching. Now there is no longer an idiot box, an intelligent box sitting and then you are communicating on that. So here is an example of how an integration of different music, different languages, and different views, different personalities can all be integrated and put on a very smart TV in years to come. So this is sort of an old view, which what has happened is many of these companies are playing a very significant role, and I happen to see that at Qualcomm during my visit. So this is very interesting, and I'm sure even in India there may be a lot of companies working on many of these ideas, but this is very much rich in research, technology, commercialization, which is sort of having an impact all around the world. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you very much for being here.